passion, purpose, and the and social web. And, and the the way that I got to this is that my life is about passion. That's what I get to do. And so I'm going to start with the introduction, a little bit about what I do and and how I got to where I am. So who am who am I? I've been 20 years in the camping industry. When I'm speaking in a different group, I usually pause there because yes, there is a camping industry. It's true. And I've gotten to work at camps and visit camps all over the country. And so I've spent some time seeing what other camps do and, and how they operate. And I'm going to apply that in a little bit about the kinds of things that uh, I like to do at camp. Now, I, I may be a camp director, but I'm a tech lover. Now, there are differences, and I think you guys would know this, between being a tech lover and a tech expert. I'm, th this doesn't say tech expert. I like gadgets. I've had lots of fun with gadgets, but I may not necessarily be up on the times with all of the gadgets that I use. There may be things that I, that I do that aren't up on the times. Now, that's, that's a little bit facetious, uh, but that was, as a camp director, that was my first piece of tech that I ever really picked up and, and started playing with. But what I found out at that point was that there weren't a lot of camp directors, surprisingly enough, that were using digital ways to keep their calendar and write notes and do that kind of stuff. And since that time, I've had uh, just about everything I can. I'm, I'm really lucky that my wife um, doesn't mind not having the newest things. So I've had every iPhone. Um, I keep upgrading, and then she gets the old one, and we our contract cycles. Because you know that the, with, typically when the new iPhone comes out, you're still within your two-year contract. So it doesn't, you know, you're like, what am I going to do? Well, I hand it down to my wife. I take her new contract, and I go, I go forward from there. I'm a husband. My wife does not like me to take pictures of her and show her. So I'm going to show, um, even though she's an extremely beautiful woman, I'm going to show what I'm most proud about. My wife is a paramedic working for Washington County EMS. And what that means is she goes out every single day and saves people's lives. That's pretty amazing. I mean, I think I do some pretty cool things, but I don't save people's lives every single day. I'm also a father, and the kids have to do things that they don't necessarily want to do sometimes. So when we go out places and there's costumes and hats and that kind of stuff, we get to try them on. Now, the personalities of those three children show a little bit, but if I describe them, they'll show a little bit more. My oldest, who is now 14, I have a it takes me a little bit to say this. I have a freshman in high school. Yeah, it doesn't seem possible to have a freshman in high school. But the oldest one, who is uh, over here, Salem, um, is not the outgoing girl the way that her father is. She's much more introverted the way that her, her mother is. And so she, when she does something silly, she has to make a silly face like that. This one has her mother's attitude. Okay. Now, this one has a combination of personalities. Salem has a combination, but Indigo has her mother's attitude. And now, as 11, I'm realizing what that really meant when my wife was younger. So, my wife admits to her having her attitude. Um, and I can't talk too much because the middle one there is mini-me. Um, when he does something and my wife goes, I can't believe he did that, typically I'm going, I can't. I can see. Now, that's, that's helped me out because I can be inside of his head sometimes. So we were at Schlitterbahn there in uh, New Braunfels, and we walked up on one of these big slides, and there was an inner tube sitting up on the rock, and there was this big, steep rock. And we were walking up, you know, getting ready to get in line. We were walking up, and I looked over at the inner tube, and I went, man, how cool would it be if he tipped it up on its edge and rolled it down this big mountain and to the crowd and all those people? That would be really cool. I thought that in my head. Now, as an adult, most of the time those things stop for me between my head and the actions. And I looked over, and my son went, and took a step forward like this, and I said, stop. Don't roll that down the rock. How did you know? That's how I knew. But here's the thing. Passion is something that I have always been able to do. I consider myself extremely lucky that every job that I've ever had as an adult, I have been passionate about. That's, that's pretty amazing. I didn't realize how amazing that was. Now, I also work for not-for-profits, so it's a good thing that the passion is there because the pocketbook isn't necessarily there, but I've been passionate about it, and I have a really good friend of mine, and, and early on, I was working non-for-profits, and he was doing mortgages, and he worked for this bank, and he did this real estate, and he did kind of did all these different things, but he was always making money. He always, you know, had a new car, and he owned a few houses, and, and this kind of stuff. We'd go out and do things, and one time we were out, and I was always, you know, kind of looked at him and saying, man, that's... It's cool that he's got all this stuff. And he said to me, he's like, you know, 
I've always been so jealous of you. I have yet to find what I love. That was pretty impactful for me. And so that's what I've been able to do. I continue to be able to do that. Now, I think that not everybody is as lucky as I am. I think sometimes you have to get to a point to where you get to do what you love. I've been lucky enough that I've been able to do that. But passion is the important part for me. And I think if we look in the things that we do and how we're using, whether it's technology, whether you know, we're on the web or we're programming or doing things that I don't understand, I thought the keynote was great. And I understood about this much of what he said. I, I understood about this much of the questions that some of you guys were asking. So um, I'm really interested to go see, you know, what that's all about. But instead, um, Camp for All uses Shipple, and that makes our website really nice. So we like that. So my business is about power, and my business is about purpose. I get to change people's lives. And my wife goes out and saves people li people's lives, and that's pretty cool. I get to change people's lives. And that's pretty cool. I really like that. And so I've got this focus, okay, the stuff that I do is about purpose. The stuff that I do is about meaning and it has value. And I get to work with what I believe to be the best camp in the country. I say that, I said earlier, I have worked at a number of camps and I have visited a significant amount more. I'm very involved in the camping community, very involved in the special needs camping community. Yes, there is one of those as well. And I get to go over and, and, and help camps around the country do things to kind of take it to the next level. When I was recruited to come down to Texas, I lived in Illinois. And at that point in my life, six years ago, if you had said, at some point you're going to be living in Texas, I would have said, no, probably not. <laughs> I'm a Midwest guy. I kind of like it up there. And I got an email saying, hey, we, are you interested in applying for this job at Camp for All? I didn't even know what Camp for All was. At that point, I was very involved in the special needs camping community, but I did not know what Camp for All was. And I found that a little strange. I found it more strange after I came down. And uh, I said, well, you know, let's talk. And so I talked on the phone. I said, I have a bunch of questions for you. And so basically my first phone call was me interviewing the CEO at the time. And at the end of that phone call, she said, I would really like to interview you on Thursday. I said, okay, let's do that. So my wife gets home. She's like, hey, how'd that phone call go? Tell me about that camp. And I'm like, well, you know, really well. I told her about the camp. She's like, that's really cool. I said, yeah, I have an interview on Thursday. Where's this camp again? In Texas. And you're, you have an interview. I said, yeah, I'm not going to go down there, but I just want to learn more about it. So I did the interview on Thursday. My wife gets home at the end of the day, and she said, so how'd that interview go? And I said, well, you want to take a trip? She goes, a trip? I'm like, yeah, they're going to fly us down. Okay, so we'll go down. Now, I had just gotten a promotion. I was the vice president of camping and recreation for Easter Seals. A really nice title happen to like camp director better, but it's a really nice title. And so I was not looking for a job. I was not looking for a place to go, but I came down and I found out some things about Camp for All that took me in that next direction for my passion. And that's the kind of stuff that I want to share with you real quick before we, we get into a little bit more. But the things that I found out, first off, is Camp for All's mission. We serve, or we work with other not-for-profits, other partners. It's that collaboration, and that's the part of this mission that I really like. Camp for All is a unique, barrier-free camp working in partnership with other nonprofits to enrich the lives of children and adults with challenging illnesses and special needs and their families throughout the year. How many people have ever worked on a mission statement? Okay, so if you've worked on a mission statement, you know a little bit more about that right there, because when you work on a mission statement, you work on it forever. There's lots. I mean, there's every single word is the supposed to be there? Or do we need to figure out something else? There's a lot of stuff that we do throughout the year. Families, children, and adults. That's what Camp for All does. And the part that I like the most is the collaboration. Now, anytime you've worked in collaboration, I, you know, I talk to people when you've done school work, when you, when you were in high school or you were in college and you had those projects. Is that, did everybody have those projects that were, you're like, all oh, this group got together, we, you know, we jived really well, everything's going good, and man, the product was great at the end of it. Have you had the other groups too? Yeah. The ones where this guy really just skips class most of the time, and this girl doesn't want to be involved very much, doesn't even like the class, and you feel like you're doing all the work. Well, that can be a problem with partnerships. That's not the problem that we have with our partnerships. We don't, that's why the collaboration works, because our partners are fully invested in what we do. Our camp is their camp. That's how we were founded. We were 16 different organizations got together at the beginning and said, we want a camp. 
but we don't want to run it. We want you to run it. We just want a place to go. And so they are still invested in that. And our three founders, two doctors from Houston and a businessman, got together. They are still actively involved in our board of directors. So we work with 56 other not-for-profits around Houston, around Austin, in the greater camp community, and around the country. We have, inter we have uh, national camps as well, and some international campers. Camp for All pays 63% of what it costs for those groups to come to camp, to be at camp. So they have other costs to get there, but to be at camp, we pay 63%. Our original partnership model was that we wouldn't charge more than 50% of the cost. But with the way that the economy has been going, that our part portion of the cost has continued to go up. Even though we've raised our rates a little bit, we feel like that's part of that partnership model that we're taking it together with our partners. Last year, we served over 7,500. I don't have the numbers in for this year, but I have a feeling that they're going to close in on 8,000. So hopefully next year I'll get to change that slide to 8,000. It was over 7,500 last year, though. Children and adults with special needs and challenging illnesses. And since 1998, we've served 88,000 children and adults. That's a pretty amazing number. My business is about passion and purpose. So it makes it easy for me to say passion. I can, I can look at every day with passion. I can step forward every day and think about passion. And I don't know how many of you in the last 24 hours have uh, re-listened to Steve Jobs' commencement address at Stanford. I don't know how many people have listened to it in the last 24 hours. Again, okay, well, there are some parts. I would re recommend it. I, I, listen, I had listened to it before, but I thought it was good. And there are parts in that where he talks about if he does not get up in the morning and say, I'm excited about doing what I'm going to do today, if today were my last day, I would be happy with what I'm doing today. If he wakes up too many mornings in a row and the answer is not yes, it's time to change. Well, there's occasion, there are occasions when my answer is not yes. But for the most part, my answer is yes because, because of the passion and purpose of Camp for All and the business that I do. But I guess here's my message, and I get to do a lot of speaking, and I, I was talking earlier about how when I first started doing conference speaking and talking, I used to talk to people about things that they could do and, and you know, here, here are some ideas and offers and stuff like that. Now I've done a lot of conferences, so I'm not gonna, now I'm going to tell you what you should do. You can decide whether you're going to do it or not, but I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to make suggestions, I'm going to tell you what I think you should do. I think you should live every day when you go to work, and everything you do in that day, it should be with passion and purpose, because my business is about it. But you know what? So is yours. Regard I don't know what you guys do, but I know people who go to work every day with passion. They may not be serving children and adults with special needs and challenging illnesses, but they are doing something that they can live, they can do with passion. In addition to that, you get to take your skills. You can take the things that you do, the things that you're passionate about, and you can apply them to other organizations that you're involved with. So we, you know, we, we hear a lot about marketing and PR. What are you doing to help market and PR the not-for-profit that doesn't have the marketing budget that's around you? Those are some options, some things that you can look at and say, here's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of something with passion and purpose. And obviously, one of the things that I would like everybody to be involved with is Camp for All. But that may not be what you need to be involved with. We need to find it. So I love making last-minute changes, and I put this in there yesterday. Um, because I really feel like it's something that we should think about more. My father worked for 40 years in the same factory. So far, the longest I've been in any one place is six years. So I've moved through lots. Now, I plan on being at Camp for I'm going to hit that. Maybe I'll hit that 40 number that my father had. But I plan on being here for a long time, but I moved around. That kind of dedication, you don't see that as much in the workplace these days. He worked 40 years, and he had an absolute passion for being precise about what he did. He didn't necessarily like the people he worked with, but he liked what he did, and he had that passion. And, and he said things, says things like, you don't do anything half way, although that's not the way he said it. And that's something that sticks in my head. He does it with passion. He does it all the way, and he goes all the way through. So your time is limited. Don't waste it living somebody else's life. Are you doing something that somebody told you you should do? Are you doing something that is right for you? And whether that means the day-to-day that you go to work, or the Saturday and Sunday that you do outside of work. What is it that you're doing that makes a difference in the world? Because that's what we need to be thinking about doing. I get to do that every day at Camp for All, but what, if you're in marketing, if you're a website design company, I will tell you that those guys are passionate 
about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're passionate about helping others. That's some pretty amazing stuff. So I, I said that I spoke at TEDx, and I'm not going to do the, the TEDx thing. But there was something that I talked about. The reason why we give back, the reason why we go out and we do other things is a concept that I believe I created, although I'm not sure that anything is ever really created. Selfless selfishness. It's that idea that there's a reason that we give. Now, I don't mean that from a, from a negative standpoint. I actually mean this in a positive way. On a daily basis, I get way more than I put into things. And the reason I came up with this is that people will come up to me, and they, you know, I work with children and adults with special needs, and so I interact with kids with autism who scream at the top of their lungs, or kids with learning differences or behavior disorders that will throw a fit and lay out screaming and, and, and doing that, or campers that, need, that don't have control of their own bowel and bladders and need help. Those are the kinds of kids and adults that I get to work with. And people look at that and they go, man, it takes a special person to do what you do. And I acknowledge them. I say thanks and I move on, knowing full well that they don't understand that I get way more out of it than I ever put into it. I get way more out of it than I ever put into it. I get this good feeling, and it's, it's this excitement that I get to change the world. I get to do something. I get to make a difference, and I, that happens to me often. And so that's where I came up with the, the selfless selfishness. It's because it's not really me being selfless. I like it. And the more I do it, the more I like it. And so now, have you ever, have you ever stopped by the side of the road and helped somebody out? Or help, you know, pick up something somebody dropped, you go, you walk away and you're like, man, this feels pretty good. That's the same kind of thing. I get to do that on a daily basis. And I had an experience a few years back driving from Illinois to Texas. And a um, big family trip, had our, uh, you know, the minivan, rocking the minivan on a, on a week and a half trip. So we got luggage, three kids, my wife and I, and we, uh, about a day before we're going to leave Wisconsin, actually, is where we were at at the time. We looked at the radar, the forecast, there's a huge winter storm coming straight up 44 through Oklahoma, Missouri, Illinois. We said, let's get on the road early. So we took off. It, what took us 24 hours straight to get up to, took us three days to get back. And we're in Oklahoma, driving through ice, ice this thick on the roads, because apparently they don't make salt in Oklahoma. Being from the Midwest, when it snows, you put salt on the roads. Well. It's not that they don't make it. They don't have the vehicles. It doesn't happen enough for that to be a purchase that they use. So we're driving on all this size, white-knuckled, rest stop. We change in every two to three hours, which is normally we drive longer than that. But my wife and I are changing every two to three hours. Get ready to pull on the highway. I hear the rumbling. Something's going on. I back back up, looked at it. I've got a flat tire. So I'm underneath the van trying to get the spare tire down, and it won't come down. And it won't come down, and I've, I've knocked it. I've got the, the – at one point I had the van up on the – on the lift, and I'm underneath trying to push this tire, at which point my wife says, you know, maybe you want to bring the van back down before you get underneath it and push that tire and push it. I can't get it off of anything. I cut my hand open. I'm soaked to the bone on this ice. I'm cold. I'm bleeding. Cars are just going by off of the rest stop. And this guy pulls up in a beat-up Toyota, and he gets up, and he he gets out of his car, and he's like, do you need any help? And he's, you know, he's dressed in what I consider, you know, working clothes, outdoor working clothes, you know, beat up vehicle. And he's like, do you need any help? And I'm like, I cannot get my spare down. I'm away from home. I can't get my spare down. We need, I need to get to Walmart because that's where I bought it, and I can, you know, get the discount or whatever. And he's like, okay. So he opens up his trunk, pulls out his spare. He's like, why don't you take mine? I'm like, w take your spare? And he goes, yeah, just take it. I'll show you where the Walmart is, and I can get it from you later. So I start to, you know, take the lug nuts off of my tire, and he comes up, kind of puts his hand on my shoulder, and he's like, why don't you let me do that? You know, I've got blood running down my hand, and I'm soaked, and the kids are over here playing in the snow because my wife moved them away from me because it's possible that the things I was saying were not appropriate for them. Puts the tire on, takes me to Walmart, gives me his phone number, and goes home. He says, when your tire's fixed, why don't you call me? I'll come get my tire. How many people in this room would give somebody their spare tire and then go away? Yeah, me now. Yeah, I wasn't there either. I'm, I'm with you, but I wasn't there either. But now I'm waiting. You know, I pull up the side of the road, somebody's with tire. I'm like, I pull over the side of the road, and I'm going, I want to go give him my tire. Because I, I feel that, that that's the, yeah, that's the, that's the pay it forward. I want to give him my tire. 
That's the kind of stuff that makes you feel good. And, I, and, and at one point, I was like, man, what a sacrifice for him. But what I realized is it made him feel good to do that. Now, it made me feel really good for him to do that. But it made him feel good to do that. So it's not sacrificial to give to people. I do want to share with you, though, something that is sacrificial. So defining, I just gave you a story that I don't feel, really feel any more sacrificial. I felt very grateful that he did that for me, but I don't feel it was sacrificial. This is sacrificial. No. Oh, that's on. This isn't. Doesn't that seem pretty sacrificial? Well, this may not work anyway. All right. Uh, car seat because oh, look at there you. was a new car seat and I didn't know how to okay. unhook it. And so, oh, yep. um, uh, what I did is that I got a blanket that we had. I'm not um, a Mac user. I'll explain that. One first. morning, and I just put it over him and I held myself there over him until I fainted. And the next thing, I woke yeah. up outside of the car in somebody's arms. There you go. Well, when I was little, of course, I, mean, I got burned in a car fire. And the first thing I remembered that popped in my head was this big explosion in the front of the car. And uh, two of my little brothers were up in the front. And uh, what I had to do was I had to run up to the front and uh, save him. So what I did is I got one of my little brothers and I threw him out. I didn't throw him out, but I threw him in the back to get him out of the fire. And I couldn't get my littlest brother out of the car, uh, car seat because it was a new car seat and I didn't know how to unhook it. And so um, uh, what I did is that I got a blanket that we had from one morning and I just put it over him and I held myself there over him until I fainted, and the next thing, I woke up outside of the car in somebody's arms, and that's basically it. <coughs> Brent is the gentleman that comes to a burn camp that happens at Camp Brawl, and I had the opportunity to talk with him and meet with him, but the better opportunity for me, not that I don't like Brian, I love him. Um, the better opportunity for me was that because of Thank you. <laughs> last summer, I'm like, he's waving. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Um, <laughs> last summer, I had the opportunity to work with Camp Janice, and I decided to put my keys and my radio as the camp for all camp director aside, and I was a counselor inside a cabin. And it was a great experience. I, haven't been, I hadn't been a counselor working directly with campers since, like, the mid-'90s. So um, that was a long time ago. I was 10, I think, when it, when it happened. But um, it was the mid-'90s I was working, in, and I've been teaching – counselors, how to be a counselor in a cabin all that time. Hadn't been back in the cabin. So there was no pressure for me to be a good counselor. At, my kids made it easy to be a good counselor because they were great kids. And I got to see some of the things that they do that are sacrificial. Me spending time in a cabin with them, that's not sacrificial. I get more out of that. And, and I get to meet kids like Brandon, who my wife said after seeing this video, she said, I want our daughter to marry him. And I said, I don't want our daughter to marry anybody. So, <laughs> but if I did, Brandon might be on the list. He's too old for her. He's 16. So what does this have to do with the social web? The thing about the social web is that 
we, we have to look and we have to define what is it really. And I'm not going to I'm not going to spend a lot of time defining the social web or web for you guys, especially since I could probably learn a lot more about it from you than I could give to you. But I do want to talk a little bit about what it is and a little bit about what it isn't, because I think we sometimes get this misconception of, of the idea of social media or social web or whatever you want to call it. It's about relationships. And I will tell you that this is a lesson that I think I knew anyway, but I really learned in 09 at Shippelcon. I really, I, I, I really learned about the relationships that happen. And people will say to me, I get to do, by the way, I do social web and social media sessions for people who aren't like you. People like you, I don't need to do that. But for people who aren't like you, I talk to them about it. And, and one of the sessions that I do is called, Why Do I Want to Know What You Had for Breakfast? And people are like, yeah, you know, I don't want that, that Twitter thing. And, you know, I, I tried to get on the Facebook, you know, but uh, I don't know what that is. Why do I want to know what you're doing all the time? You probably don't want to know what I'm doing. But because I know what you had for breakfast yesterday, I also have built a relationship with you. And I have relationships with people who I am interested in what they had for breakfast. Actually, I'm more interested in where they had it. I want to know what that place was like. So it is about that relationship. And so when we think about the social web, we think about using it for passion and purpose. I don't, I don't think about SEO. I, I don't want to drive people to who I am or to my site because I did some, a gimmick. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that in a different arena, but that's not my arena. I don't want to do a gimmick to get people to come see Camp for All. I want to share the message of Camp for All. I want to build a relationship with people who want to know more about Camp for All. That's what the social web is for me, building that relationship. And I do it on a hit and miss basis because I get really busy. So I'm in and out and I'm working, I'm doing the best that I can at it. But I also have started to get help doing that from people who have bought into the Camp for All mission. The same people that come out to camp, and I give a tour to, and they see it, and it changes what they thought about it. I invite every single person here to come out and, give it, and do a tour at Camp for All. It's in Burton. It's a great country drive. It's wonderful. And it will change what you think about it, even if you think you know about it right now. It's about marketing, and it's about information sharing. I skipped right over marketing. Uh, the last speaker is better at that than me. So... Um, but information sharing. Notice I didn't say it's necessarily about information. I said it's about information sharing. And the reason it's about information sharing is because it's thinking about, you know, how we get the information that we want to get out of the web. And I want to show you information that I shared this past week. How many people here are Dancing with Stars fans? Okay, there we go. How many people have never watched an episode of Dancing with Stars? Okay. So I agree. I'm like that too. But this is something that I shared this week. But in transfer weight. My most memorable year is the year I was injured. I was driving a Humvee in Iraq when my front left tire went over a landmine. The last thing I remember is being in Iraq and, and, and feeling and thinking my life was going to end. The next biggest thing I remember is just seeing my mother. And then about a week later, asking the nurse to see my face and my body for the first time. And I picked my head up and... I don't know, I just, I just froze for, you know, a couple seconds and just long enough to turn my head to each direction just to look, to see how bad it was. I became depressed, I had regret. I started to blame, I started to question. It didn't make sense to me why I was 19 years old and why my life was completely upside down. I just thought to myself, I would have been better off if I wouldn't have survived. It was a tough time in my life and I felt that there was no one else in this world that could actually understand where I was coming from, that could understand the pain that I was feeling. I stayed awake at night in my hospital bed, and when everybody was gone and all the lights were off, and I just cried. I felt that's the only thing I could do. And I remember my mother you know, telling me that, you know, whoever was going to be in my life, for whatever reason, they were going to be in my life because of who I am as a person and not what I looked like, because she knew that was a big concern of mine. And something about those words was, you know, sharp enough to kind of really stick. That moment, I chose. I don't know why, I just chose in that moment to, to fight and just to try to be upbeat, try to be positive every single moment from that day on. The song we're dancing to this week is Tim McGraw, If You're Reading This. The song is about a soldier that sends a letter home. And if the spouse is reading this letter, that means that he didn't survive war. There's a lot of men and women, there's a lot of families out there that don't get that second chance. 
So for me, this dance is a tribute to the men and women that didn't make it home. That's a story that I feel like needs to be told. And I don't watch Dancing with the Stars. And, and if you want to see the dance, which if you're a dance person, I think it's a pretty amazing dance. I'm not that into dancing. But I liked the song, and so I watched the whole thing, and you can go see it. This was information that I wanted to share this past week because it's a message that I feel needs to be told. And so the social web is about information sharing, but we pick that kind of information. We also pick the kind of information that comes to us. So I'm going to do an exercise here. I'm going to put a name up here, and I want you to put your hand up if you know who that person is. So put your hand up if you know who that person is or you know something about them. Put your hand up if you know who that is. All right, bring it down. Put your hand up if you know. Okay. Put your hand up if you know who that is. Put your hand up. I do a really obvious one. Although I have to tell you, I had to kind of ask what she does. I found out that I'm not, that not yeah, yeah, I found out nothing. So <laughs> that, 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 was, that was the answer. I don't really know much about her. Put your hand up if you know who that is. So I put, and I didn't do this on purpose. I realized after I did it that I have three females and three males. Males. It's not a gender thing. But I will tell you, um, you know, Casey Anthony with uh, her daughter, and I didn't follow it, so I don't know. I know that there was a case in Florida with Casey Anthony and the daughter, and that was a horrible tragedy, tra tragedy, tragedy, and I don't know anything more about it other than it's a horrible thing when that happens. I know that Amanda Knox came home, and I know that she was convicted of something in Italy or France, Italy, Italy, um, and then set free, and I had, I found out about Kim Kardashian this week, so she Apparently is a reality person who doesn't really do a whole lot, except now she does because, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Dakota Meyer, Leroy Petrie, and Salvatore Guente, and I'm not sure I'm saying his last name right, are Medal of Honor winners who were awarded the Medal of Honor in 2011, this year. I didn't go back in time to figure out who they were. They were awarded the Medal of Honor this year. And I've tested, I tested this because I decided that I wanted to see what this was like, and I get the same kind of thing. Now, a couple people at work went, Leroy Petrie. See, I, I don't know why, but I think I remember it. Well, it's because I showed you the YouTube video of him getting his award because those are the things that are important to me. Now, I'm not saying that – I'm not going to pass judgment on whether you follow Amanda Knox or Kim Kardashian or Casey Anthony trial and what that means to you. I'm not going to give you information that, and what that means to you. You have to decide what that is. But it's important for me that people know those three guys. And I will tell you that Dakota Meyer thinks it's important that people know the guys who died that he didn't save. He saved a lot of people. But that's not his count. His count are about the ones that he didn't save. And so I would challenge you to go Google him and find out a little bit more about the, those three guys. And you can find out more about some other guys around that as well. Passes does the team in white make? So watch the basketball for the team in white. No. The answer is 13. How many people had it? 13? Good. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Feel free to go YouTube that and watch it yourself, because then you'll rewind back to the beginning, because you'll say, no, they messed something up with the second half. No, go back to the beginning. The moonwalking bear was always there. In fact, how many people saw the moonwalking bear? Because I heard a couple people go, what? Yeah, the moonwalking bear was there the whole time. But it's easy to miss something that you're not looking for. In this day and age, we have more information out there to find than we know what to do with. The question is, what are you looking for? When you go out to the web, what are you looking for? What information are you trying to get? 
Here's the more important question to me, because that's really up to you. My question is, what information are you sharing? What is the information that you're sending back out to the people that you know about? And are you passing on information about things that have to do with purpose, things that are meaningful, things that have passion? I retweet a lot of stuff. But I really think about what are the most important things I've ever tweeted. And th th this is a fun crowd to say that to, because some crowds, when I say that, they're like, uh, is anything that you tweet important? Yeah, maybe. But this is a crowd who understands that. So one of the most important things I ever tweeted was about a young girl named Carla. Carla, also from Camp Janice. You know, I've got this connection to Camp Janice at our camp for the burn victims. And, and Carla um, is from Mexico and does not speak English. And there's a, there's a group of uh, campers who come that, that are non-English speaking, that come from Shriners, typically fairly fresh burns at that point. They're in the United States, and they get to come to camp. And the translator left the ropes course to go up with somebody else. And she, she was down there with a couple of us, and she was going to go on the high ropes course. Level one is about 25, 30 feet. Level two is about 40 feet. She's going to go up on the ropes course. I'll go back to that in a second. So that's the tower that Carla was going to climb. Starting this ladder, going up here. It's actually her right there. And going up to this level. And she's down at the bottom. We said, level one or level two? And she said, she put her two fingers up, pointed all the way up. Now, let me tell you about Carla. She doesn't have, she's missing one arm. She has two fingers on the other arm, and she has no calf muscles in one of her legs. And yet, she wanted to climb this ladder, and when you get to here, get out of the way, when you get to up here, there are staples that you can put your fingers into the, to grab to climb up. And so she gets up there, and she starts climbing, and she's climbing, and she's climbing. She gets up the ladder, and she's holding on the staples, and she's going like this. She's pulling herself in, stepping up putting a little bit of weight on this leg, and then going, letting go, and going back up. Now, she's got a helmet and a harness, and she's on a rope, but it's still to let go like that, and she's pulling herself up. She gets to level one. She's like, oh, I think I may need to stop it. She didn't say that, but she starts going like this, starts going like this, and we're like, are you sure? Do you want to go up? Level two was your goal. Do you want to meet your goal? Do you want to change your goal? And she looks up, she looks up, and she points back up, and she gets back out onto the pole, pulls herself every step, pulls herself every step. I see her lean back. I don't know how long it took. I wasn't the person belaying, but I was out there with the person belaying, watching Carla as she went up to the top. And she gets up to the top, and she gets this great look on her face, and the facilitator comes over and talks to her, and she's got a look on her face, and she's severely burned. It's you know, the emotions, but you can still see the emotion on her face that she made it all the way up to the top. And I turned around. This was in 2009. I turned around, and I tweeted. I just saw a 14-year-old girl with one arm, two fingers, on her other hand and no muscles in her leg, climb 40 feet in the air. What am I complaining about? My problems are first world problems. That is an amazing young lady. So here's my challenge. Find your passion and do something about it. And I hope that that's a twofold passion. One, I hope that you go to work every single day and have passion. And I want you to go out and use the skills that you have to help other organizations. Camp Fraud would be a great one. There's my commercial. But so would Camp Janice. You know what? Houston has a, a number of, there's the center in Houston. There's Bo's Place in Houston. Um, the Periwinkle Foundation. There's lots of organizations that can use help that are right here in Houston. You go to Volunteer Houston. Dot com, and you can find out a whole list of organizations in the area. Find your passion, use your talent, and let's watch people go to amazing heights. That's Carl on the top of the tower. Thank you guys very much. So the idea was to leave a few minutes, although I know I went over because I saw the big stop sign. The idea was to leave a few minutes if people have questions. Do any, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, that's that's a really good question because, and and it's something I think non for profit not for profits are really working on in terms of what's okay to get out there. Here's the market: Facebook, Twitter. That's the market. That's what everybody is doing, and that's how we get PR. That's how we get information out. But um, up until actually, there are still a lot of camps in the United States that have a no social media policy for their staff during camp. Zero. And those are some of their be the best ambassadors. So obviously we don't have that policy. But our camp staff can't put a picture of a camper up on their Facebook page. It's not allowed. They can't. However, they can go to the Camp for All's Facebook page and they can put it up there. Or, or we can put it, they can't actually post it. We can post it up there and they can tag themselves in it and then it's on their page. From our, from our Facebook page. They can't post it because we have permission from the parents and per per permission from the organization to use those materials. And so that's what we do. Now we also get camps that can't, we can't show pictures and so we have to tell stories. We can't use names, but we can still tell stories and not use names. And one of the things that we've started to get our staff to do, we have a, uh, every year we have a Facebook private secret page for our camp staff. And we start recruiting them in January and we add them as they go. 2011 page. The end of 2011, actually in the fall, it kind of dies down. We stop using it. We'll bring 2012. So we, I think we've got two of those, and, and 10 and 11. We'll bring 12 in. They post stuff. They tell stories in there. And so we encourage them to take those stories. Sometimes we'll take them. We encourage them to take those stories and tell them out because the stories are what really matters when you can't, when you can't share pictures. Obviously, pictures say a lot. So pictures are what we want to get out there as much as we can. But when we can't show a picture of a child, then than telling the story. And I think that's getting ambassadors to tell the story. The other part that you said is, I do as much as I can to tell stories, but I'm the camp director. And there are advantages. I love my job. It's the best job in the world. But for that four days when I was the counselor inside the cabin, I got to work directly with the campers. That brought me back to why I got into this business and why I like it so much. I don't have those stories the way that my staff do. Not as many as I used to. And so encouraging them, so having a forward thinking social media policy as opposed to what I would consider to be an archaic one. Uh, tell people, tell your college age students that they can't post anything that they've done at camp on Facebook and all you're proving that they're going to do is make sure that you're locked out so you don't see their Facebook page. They're going to share it. So let's control how they're sharing it because there are laws and we have to make sure that we're following those. But let's get those stories out there. Use it as a PR thing and allow them to do that. We posted this last summer, I had a, an intern that was just a, a photo um, social media intern posted every single day onto Facebook and then tagged all of our staff so they could tell stories about pictures that they couldn't post on their own Facebook page. Now, there were some camps that we couldn't do that with and there were some campers we couldn't do that with. Yes, ma'am. Oh, how did I find my... That's a lunch conversation. Um, I, you know, I think I tripped and fell into it. I, I really do. I, uh, I spent four years in the Marine Corps got out to go to college, and I, I learned that I could teach well. I had, a, I had an ability to teach people things, and so I decided to get a degree in English education. And one summer, I found a camp for inner city Chicago kids. And I decided to go there and become the, the uh, aquatics director. My Marine Corps background was in aquatics, and so I decided to go become the aquatics director at a camp for inner city kids. Fell in love with the kids. The, my favorite kids are still the ones whose teachers, teachers know their names first. You know those kids? The teacher has their name first. Those are my favorite kids. Those are my favorite kids. I love them. When somebody says, oh, this kid is driving me crazy, I'm like, okay, I want to go meet that kid. I like him already, or I like her already. Although I like, I'm better with boys than I am with girls. 13-year-old girls. Whoo. Yes, sir. Two things, recruit well, and I mean that. I, I, Denver Johnson, who's a football coach for uh, um, Illinois State University when I was in Illinois, um, told me a story one time about how he, had, he was down in the SEC, and I can't remember what school, I should know this, but uh, he got the SEC assistant coach of the year one year. And he was like, that was pretty amazing. He did a lot of work. He put a lot of work, but he had these great, this great talent. He said the next year, because he was so motivated, he said I was three times a better coach the following year, but a lot of seniors had graduated, their team didn't do that well, and he wasn't even nominated for the position. He said the moral of that story is recruit well. The staff matter. And so we spend a long time finding our staff. From, from 
college students who are working in a season that get a Skype, at a minimum, a Skype interview where they're asked questions like, can you tell us a story or sing a song right now? We, that, we want you to sing a song. And how much does the ice on an ice rink weigh? The crazy questions to find out who these people really are. So we recruit that. Now, full-time staff are two, three, four interviews on site. Whether, wherever they're coming from, we fly them on site. We meet with them. So we spend a lot of time recruitment. I would really say that that's the very first thing. And then because we find the right people, we let them do their job. So I find people who are passionate, and I turn them loose to let them do their job. And I've been in the camping industry for 20 years. So somebody comes to me and says, hey, I want to do this in aquatics. I could very easily say, well, I've seen that done before, or it's done this way, or I don't do any of that because I haven't seen it done by you for this group in 2012. Things change. And so I, don't, I try not to get caught in the way that I've always done things. Now, my job is to help guide, help make sure that, that, that Camp for All is going in the direction that we need to, to go in and let them do their work. And in, in many areas, they're more talented in that area because they're doing it on a daily basis. You know, when I, I've done lots of ropes course work. I've, I've spent years working on ropes course. But I have summer staff who are more capable at it than I am because they do it on a daily basis. So let them do their job. Monitor, make sure they're focused, make sure that they're doing the right direction, but let them do their job. Those are the two things that I would say. Any other questions? I think it's lunchtime anyway, so I'll be up here if anybody else has any other questions. Thank you guys very much.